cross oh, comes in. White with the header. Oh, One more for England. And here comes Whitehead. It's gold for Great Britain. Hi everyone and welcome to another exciting podcast with myself, Richard Whitehead. And myself, Ellen White. Yes, this is Track and Ball. And today we've got a guest that is not only from the other side of the pond. Yes, United States of America. She is a Paralympic Wonder Woman. She's an amazing character that's won 17 Paralympic medals, seven of which were golden. She is an advocate for disability rights. She's actually changed the law in America so that every disabled person can have the opportunities to participate in PE. She is somebody that's selfless, she's determined, and this is Tatiana McFadden. So hi, Tatiana, and thanks for joining us from uh, from the United States of America. Whereabouts are you actually at the moment? I am in Florida, in Tallahassee, so like way up in the panhandle. I I came here for training for Tokyo to get used to the humidity and the climate change, and um, I just really fell in love with the warm weather. Coming from Illinois, it's so cold. Like today, it was 33 degrees, so I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm so be jealous. like in Florida <laughs> where it was like 80 outside. So I'm like, I. I just love it. So now I And is that where you're living at the moment? Are you are you up there? Yeah, I'm living, yeah, in Tallahassee. So yeah, I I actually sold my house because oh, I wow. just want <laughs> the warm I want the warm weather. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> I've been like in Illinois for like the past 10, 11 years and I'm like, what was I thinking? It's so cold in the winter. Have you got two spare rooms? Like, I know two people that might want to move over and play with you for a bit. You're always welcome. You can bring your family. Thank you. You're so polite. Come here, Florida. Yeah. That's awesome. Right. So my first question or my first kind of thing was that, like, looking at pictures and videos of you, my instant thought is, wow, um, amazing athletic kind of appearance your arms are just incredible by the way ridiculous um, <laughs> and uh me and rich spoke about this you are one hell of a badass woman um so um so my first question tatiana is what do you want people's first impression of you to be i think the first impression kind of like what you said like the looking at like a woman and looking yeah. at the strength and determination yeah. instead of seeing the wheelchair first. So yeah. a lot of times, you know, it's, it's just, a even in the U S in many places, you know, disability can be like such a taboo. So oftentimes mm-hmm. people fall into looking at the chair first yeah. because my disability is not hidden. So um, I really don't want them to see, you know, the chair first because then all of a sudden in their mind they're Mm -hmm. like thinking what she can't do she can't do this she can't do that she can't you know before thinking of all the things that I can do so I'd rather see them for like my athletic ability you know comment on my you know my strength and my arms because then we're getting somewhere you know we're heading in the right direction um you can do everything Like literally, exactly. I don't know anything you can't do. Like, the majority I, of the public. You can like do more hard. than anything anybody else. You're a superhero, <laughs> hero, right? <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, I'm sure you get the same, right, Richard? Sometimes, like when you're out in public, like you know, people if they see your legs, they might make a comment, you know, or think what you can't do first. So it's yeah, just definitely. you wanna. Yeah, you want to just, I want to change that perception. Um, and it's coming. And um, yeah. as the younger generation comes mm-hmm. up, as my generation is getting older, um, it's more appreciation and acceptance, I feel like. Even in my sister's age, um, and she's um, 24. So that's a great population, too, because they're more accepting. They're more yeah. understanding. So Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they, they, they use, they'll use that as a little bit of a, an icebreaker, won't they, to chat to you about obviously your your impairment or your disability, but really they want to know about more about yourself, don't they? Well, I would hope so. Yeah, I would yeah, hope so. I, I think um, they do. I th- they they yeah. definitely see more than just the chair. I'm sure they do. Yeah, you know, I I think you know as I um, 
the first thing that I try to do is always to educate. I always try to educate first because um, I feel like that's important to like help to break the stereotype. And then, yeah, then I just tell my story and the sports that I'm involved, you know, how my journey pretty much from yeah. childhood, like how I got involved with racing and all that. Yeah. Um, sometimes in a very condensed version, wherever mm. you are. Yeah. Like, what is it, five minutes, it, you know? it could be a long journey to the supermarket, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> so I do, I share, I definitely share, um, because I think it really gives them like an insight and say like, yeah. wow, like that's amazing. They get to know, you know, the word Paralympics and, yeah. you know, wheelchair racing and marathoning. Yeah. So I do share about my athletic career for sure. And, um, and a lot of people obviously see the, the highs, but obviously your backstory is, is very obviously inspirational. And I'm sure you, you see it as just, Tatiana, this is me, and I've had to overcome all these obstacles and, and barriers. But when you think about those early days, so go right back for when, obviously, because you, you had a really tough upbringing and start, obviously, th that time when you were in, in the orphanage, and what was, what, was going through, what was going through your head at that point, and, and life, what, what, do you think life, what do you think life was going to be like for you? moving forward because even at that age you you had that aspirations and dreams surely yeah so i mean in the living in the orphanage i i only knew what i had so i i didn't really know like the outside world i didn't know about anything else but just in my environment so i didn't like know that i was not normal like i didn't know like what type of disability i had all i knew was that like i couldn't use my legs so then i had to figure out okay how am i going to move around how am i going to get to places um so i just i i think that like my like special gift at a young age is that like different perspective and different mindset and shifting and it might have just been just for survival purposes you know just trying to get around the orphanage and play with all the other kids and not feel like, you know, the outcasts are left behind. So I've always just kind of like had that mentality, but I didn't, I didn't know, you know. The so you weren't aware that you had a disability at all then? No, because, you know, I, it wasn't really um, like, you know, talked about or expressed. Mm. I mean, you have to understand that there was like a very few caregivers to a lot of children, right? <laughs> so like, the kids, we all became each other's caregiver. We weren't really taken care of by the adults, essentially. Right. So, um, so you had to learn how to like cope yourself and um, and cope the other kids. So it was a very different lifestyle. But I think it just kind of made me like who I am yeah, and sure. had this like me. I had this like mind of like mainstreaming because I was in an orphanage with all able-bodied kids. Right? Yeah. And I, I feel like if I lived in that orphanage, um, I was getting to the age I over welcomed my stay. So what that means is that at the age of five, you go into the adult orphanage. So the orphanage director actually saved my life and she just kind of like, hid my hid my paperwork so um uh, that i wouldn't go into the adult orphanage so in the adult orphanage kids with disabilities don't survive they all they most of the time get um you know they're not fed or they'll get you know like sometimes kids you know they get smuggled and they they kill them right there and then and there um and then by the time you're 16 you're out in the street you know living on your own so who knows if I would have even survived through the adult orphanage part, um, which is much scary to think about because then you're in the orphanage with like hundreds of kids at that mm -hmm. time. So uh, um, I was just very lucky and very fortunate that everything fell into the timeline yeah. accordingly. Like my, my mom happened to come in and see the orphanage and the orphanage director, she was just amazing person herself and, um, just could only do what she could do at the time. I mean, it wasn't funded, you know, by the government and the government didn't really believe in people with disabilities either. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, everything just kind of, I'm really blessed that everything fell into a certain timeline because yeah, the adult orphanage, you do not 
you know, if you experience stuff in the, you experience stuff in the, you know, early stages of your orphanage, but it's way, way different in the adult. Mm, it's not bad. Much what, what, what were like your emotions and feelings when, when your, well, your mum came and, and wanted to, to adopt you and then obviously you're moving to America, something completely <laughs> crazy, something completely different. Like what was those feelings and emotions for like, for like at that point for you? Yeah. So when my mom came in, I just automatically knew, you know, it's just like <laughs> when you're meeting like the love of your life, you know, how you just, like, you just yeah. know. <laughs> so like I just went around telling the orphanage like directors, like that's my mom, that's my mom. And she's like, okay, yeah, sure. All right. Like whatever. <laughs> um, and so, but getting onto that airplane and going <clears throat> to the U S a lot of like, a, a lot of like first things happen. I mean, leaving the orphanage was like, um, my poor mother, I was like screaming because I mean, I'm technically leaving with a stranger, right? Yeah. So, yeah, like, yeah. I was like screaming in the car ride. Then I was like, okay, it's settled. Um, and then when we got to Moscow, like I already, when we were in Moscow, I thought we were in the United States because everything was so like beautiful. <laughs> like, there was like these crystal <laughs> lights and chandeliers and like, like buffet of food and like different types of people mm. and like um so i was just like fascinated and then you get on the airplane and you, you see even more than coming to the u.s it's like really different yeah um so the adjustment was good um you know i wanted to fit in right away my parents got me involved with sports um just to help me um i was really sick and i was pretty anemic at the time like very, very anemic. Um, and so that's why my, my parents thought if we put her in a sports program, yeah. you know, she'll get healthy and she can be living an independent life. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't think I would become an athlete, but they just wanted my health. Um, so at that point, at that point, when you, <laughs> when you first, uh, tried, what sport was it? Was it athletics or was it swimming or? It was swimming, well, yeah. Swimming, it was okay. Swimming, yeah. Very similar to myself, and uh, my, myself and Ellen have, have, have spoke about kind of the power of sport. That mm -hmm. first experience of you in the pool, like, what was that like? That 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 must have got. That must have been like a a moment of actually, this is awesome. I can be who I want to be because obviously swimming as well. You're you're as buoyant as you want to be. You're as free as you want to be. That must have been amazing for the first time that you got in the pool. So my swimming experience, I was not buoyant. Um, I was like, <laughs> so I just like jumped right in. I sunk straight to the bottom. And wow. then I had to like dive down and like pick me up. It was like, okay, clearly she's not afraid to swim and get into the water. Um, and it was so funny. So the swim teacher um, who taught me how to swim, she never taught a disabled person before. So my mom said, when my mom was on the phone with her, she's like, now do you teach all types of kids? Like, let's say, you know, they may have like a problem like using their legs or, you know, she didn't specifically <laughs> yeah. say I was like <laughs> disabled. And she's like, oh, it's not a problem. Like I teach all types of kids. Like we're, it's going to be okay. And then she was like, and then okay, you're not, we'll see you soon. <laughs> and um, like to her surprise, like I was in the wheelchair and you just like see her eyes you know, open and she's like, look, I will pay you for three swim lessons, like on Let's the see mat. where we get to. You right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, and her name was Julie, and awesome. it was just the best thing. I mean, um, I just I swam with her for like several years, just learning how to learning how to swim. Um, and then I did the uh, um, at the same time, like a year later, I did the sports program awesome. in Baltimore at the age of seven. When I when I was when I went swimming. I hated it. I cried. My mum and dad Aww. wouldn't take me. My my mum and dad's friend had to take me. I was so mardy as a, a youngster. But uh, then when I when I actually found that it was something that I enjoyed and was passionate about, it makes a big difference. And then obviously you found athletics and um, what what was was that something that you you instantly kind of went bang? This is something that I'm going to be awesome at or was this something that you kind of you got in a chair and it was that that moment where you felt I'm now free and I can do whatever I want in my life yeah um getting into that so I did several different sports I did like ice hockey 
swimming, wheelchair basketball, and then I tried wheelchair racing. I loved it. And I don't know if it was like the independence of trying to grow and get better. Um, I liked swimming, but I was not the best. I think more water came out of the pool than like it stayed in the pool. So, but I, I just think it, yeah, it was like freedom. You can hear the wind like in your ears and, um, and it's something I really wanted to work hard in. Um, like I advanced quickly, like as a learner, like I love to learn. Um, I wasn't, you know, I would say, you know, the best, the best, but I was willing to take on all the challenges and to grow as quickly as possible and to be like, and then it just became, you know, um, becoming involved with the sports program. It allowed me to dream big and it allowed me to think, oh, I can be something. I can be a value of something. And that's when, you know, I wanted to be an athlete because I loved racing so much um, that like, I knew that I wanted to continue to take on that journey um and then i just got better and better my local um sports coach um in baltimore you know they trained me on the weekends and during the weekdays and i just it was like freedom it was like just the uh, uh, i just felt so happy and i just wanted to keep going and, and get faster and um yeah then i told my mom i said i wanted to go to the olympics and in 2004 and i say the olympics because in Maryland, um, Paralympics weren't, you know, in the U.S., it wasn't, you know, seen on the TV or news or, so I didn't know about it. I just thought, well, everyone goes to the Olympics. If you want to be the best, like, you go there. Um, so my parents said, <laughs> okay. And then they got <laughs> the trials for the Paralympics. And I was the youngest athlete. I was the youngest, youngest person going. Um, I was 14 and a half, wasn't 15 yet. Um, and I was competing against people twice my age. Um, a lot of people thought I wasn't going to make it because I was new on the scene. Mm -hmm. And um, it was my first, you know, big, big track meet. And Athens was my first international experience ever. Like, wow. besides, you know, coming in from Russia mm -hmm. to the US, it was my first time like competing internationally so it's been a whirlwind but a fun one what what was that experience like like for you then like obviously um going somewhere that, going to a completely different country um that you haven't traveled to before your first experience of a paralympic games like what 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 did you take away from that whole experience of being so young as well yeah you know i just you know i I had like goals of just making it to the finals. I just, you know, wanted to make sure that I was still having fun. Um, I learned a lot about routine, you know, making sure mm -hmm. I had proper equipment. I did have like older teammates that were um, really great and kind of helping me like make sure I had like a spare tire and like equipment and like proper snacks and like proper like, you know, um, recovery afterwards so like i did have like really great mentors to help me through that um but i think the the hardest part was um you know the emptiness of the stadium and mm -hmm. um and then coming back home and then the paralympics weren't celebrated so then i just mm -hmm. felt like and we weren't getting equally paid so then i just felt like okay well maybe the paralympics isn't valued you mm -hmm. know Maybe it's not important. So like that was um, like, I just felt so disappointed. So then I thought, well, you know, what would any athlete do? You know, like the, you look at the Williams sisters or like Michael Johnson, right? They just became the best. So yeah. people would listen to them. So I just thought, okay, well, I just need to like become the best whenever. And you definitely are, right? You definitely are. <laughs> With everything. And then people yeah, listen right. to me. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks for <right> that. <laughs> With everything. And then people would listen to me. And then yeah. I can tell the world, like, hey, there is no equality yet. No. Like, in the Paralympics. Change the world, right? Change <laughs> yeah, it. exactly. So in the Paralympic movement, you've you've got classification. Do you want to just uh, tell the, the viewers and the listeners just about your classification and what and what that classification means and who you race against and obviously your main competitors? Because I know you really like them. <laughs> <laughs> so the classification 
I know. The <laughs> system is tricky. Um, so I'm a 54. Um, so it's not your age then. 54 doesn't mean your age, no. No, no, no. It means, um, it means that... <laughs> It means that like I'm in the highest class classification. <laughs> that means that I have like some abs and some back extenders. Um, 53s have no abs. And then you have your um, T52s, which are like quads. Um, so it, yeah, the classification is very tricky because my competitors, some can walk. Um, mm -hmm. And then some are just like me where we have some of our um, ab extenders. Um, but for me, you know, um, uh, you just kind of have to work on your training at that point, you know, how to become the best in mechanics. Um, and so, yeah. It, and what do you, what do you think of, what do you think of like general classification of, of, of athletes? I've, I've, um, had issues with classification kind of all my life. And, um, I think classification for me, it's, it's a good platform, but it's sometimes, I've always felt that you don't want to be pigeonholed or put into a box as a person, never mind an athlete. And in disability sport, that's meant to be inclusive. Sometimes it's exclusive. You look at a lot of the other uh, disabilities that are that haven't got events in the Paralympics. They always reach out to me through social media and say, look, we've not got an event. How do we lobby to get an event at the Paralympics? What do you think of the classification system? Yeah, I it's it's tricky. Like it's, yeah, it's, a, tricky, it's right? a tricky one. So there's no like I think that we need like a new a new formula. Um but otherwise like I don't, you know, I don't have the right answer because it's just tricky and it's just complicated. Come on, Tatiana, you're the it's one. <laughs> you're the answer, right? But um so i mean i like i they had a hard time classifying me between a 53 and a 54 because like i fell in between like those two um you know those two like systems so but they said oh if you like we can take you if you're 54 if you become a 53 with the sent you home because we have our 53s so then i was okay. like well i better become a 54 because <laughs> Uh -huh. but it's uh it's tricky i mean um it's just either way i feel like it's always a battle but they need to have like a, a common happiness and i don't i don't know yeah. what that formula is I yeah, yeah cool. they need a new one so you you obviously went to to athens you won silver and bronze for your first kind of games did that help you going into beijing um that experience of obviously your first games, Athens, traveling, your routine, as you've spoken about before. Yeah, so it definitely helped me for Beijing. You know, I wanted to um, be better after Athens. I wanted to get faster. I wanted to get more medals. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I I um, switched, well, coaches. So I got, you know, a coach that could teach, you know, um, athletes of – you know, of the parallel at the Paralympics, yeah, um, elite athletes. So it was actually Chantel's coach, um, Peter, and so he kind of helped me transition from the para sports coach into the into the Paralympics. Um, yeah. So yeah, I needed that. He's a that character, right? Movement. He's a character, Peter Erickson. Yeah, wow. he's he he was uh, Ellen. He was the performance yeah. director for British Athletics okay, when I okay. went to London. And he okay. was the he was the he was the guy that said, Richard, you are too old. You can't oh, be in this team. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So me and Peter have got a funny relationship. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a funny guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's cool though, he's cool. <laughs> yeah, he's you just have to be like, okay, thank you, Peter. Um, <laughs> but um, but I need help with that transition because like your local sports coach can only take you so far. So I needed that growth and advancement. Um, so yeah, so I did, you know, I got three silvers and a bronze. I missed out in the medal in the hundred. I was really, really disappointed. Um, it was my first, first event. And um, that previous year I received a gold medal at the hundred meter. Um, it was the very first time I beat Chantel. So everyone thought I was going to be, you know, on the medal stand and, 
in 08 and I wasn't, <laughs> I was like seventh place. So that was like really, um, really, really hard for me. Um, especially because it was the opening of the event. Um, but the reason why I love athletics so much is that I remember getting off and I did an interview and then I was like so emotional afterwards because, you know, I'm like, you're representing your country. You mm -hmm. feel bad that you didn't win a medal. So that you just like, you start crying. Um, and I remember Marcel giving me a hug. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, Marcel Hoog. Yeah, so it was so sweet of him because, you know, I was so young and, um, and you know, you just, you're, I was a teenager. So I was going through a lot of adjustments, you know, in my body. I was still growing, um, trying to get stronger, but yet you're competing at the highest level. And was that so a learning it's... process? Was that, um, was that something you, you would say you learned from and developed because of that experience? Uh, competing at a young age. At, no, also not winning um, mm -hmm. in that in that uh, race where your expectations or or expectations of others were higher than than what you actually. Yeah, it learned. It made me like I had to, you know, I had to reshape my thinking because I had more events afterwards. So, so I had to like shift my whole mindset because I still had more events to do. So like my my family really helped me with that. Um, just to kind of being like, okay, Tatiana, like you, you're still going to like, okay, still got more I promise. even though you feel like the world is falling apart. Um, yeah. My family and friends really, really helped me with that. Just kind of like refocused everything. And um, then I was able to kind of like shake it off and say, okay, like, you know, I do have more events. I can still be on the podium. I can still, you know, do very well. Um, and I did, you know, I, podium in the other events so um that's what i learned at 18 years old you know i was very young so um but i'm happy that i was able to to do that such a young age because mm -hmm. you know it's tough it's really really tough um so yeah what, what was it like you said athens it was it was strange obviously empty stadiums like what was that what was it like in beijing how how were the chinese people kind of accepting of their Paralympic Games over there? Yeah, so you went, yeah, um, in Beijing, you know, the stadiums were were packed, um, you know, it was, it was so much louder. I couldn't, I couldn't even hear myself, you know, like, think, you know, your heart was pounding. Um, and I can see my parents because they they wore white with like <laughs> teeny satin on it. So I was so smart of them to do that. Um, but it, it was definitely <laughs> it was definitely a shift and adjustment yeah. from from that. Um, so it did make you a little bit nervous, but like really happy and like really mm -hmm. you know um, proud. I think it was a great games for um, Beijing to have because I think they learned a lot about disability and accessibility. Um, so, and, you know, they were able to, um, you know, get their own athletes involved and help their para sports, um, mm -hmm. you know, Paralympics to grow. So I think that was great, you know, um, and, you know, you still, you know, see those athletes um, from China competing um, and, still doing very well and you see their you know their paralympics growing so i think it's great things came came out of it for them um so i mean that's what you want you know after our games right yeah so yeah yeah no you definitely want that paralympic movement you want people talking about it you want them to see it experience it that visibility and i think that was really important um and then after the games this this is actually this right made me laugh actually. You went into marathon running and you just thought, oh, I haven't experienced that. I'll just just throw it out there. I'll, I'll do a marathon. <laughs> so t tell us like what why you decided to do that Chicago marathon. So Chicago was in yeah, it was in two thousand and nine. So I started college. Um, yeah. Adam um, Blakeney, the university coach of of Illinois. Um, he convinced me, so I had to skip, um, like part semester of the school because it started when I was there. So we had, uh, I also came in on a basketball scholarship. So oh, I wow. didn't come in on a racing scholarship. <laughs> and, um, so I was doing basketball in the morning and then like racing in the afternoon. Uh, so I was always working out, trying to do class. I was like a hot mess as a freshman. 
and so it was really tough and so when we were talking about like goals and where you know we wanted to be and yeah. like you know um well i was like well i want to add on events like you know i want to someday do the five thousand. and then he was like well he was like well what about a marathon he was like i usually have all my athletes just try it once and i was like <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Wow, just try it. Just try it. Like, yeah, I was like, I won't, I won't be one of those. I was like, come on, like it would be so much fun. And I was like, I never ran a marathon. Like in Beijing, my longest event was like 800 meters. So I was like, you've got yeah, to be. I was like, no, I won't make it. <laughs> And um, he was like, well, just think about like the whole marathon. Just think about doing your favorite event, the 400 mm -hmm. meters, about 100 times or so. And like you've completed the entire marathon. And so I was like, fine, like whatever. He was like, trust me, people are going to know you for marathoning, not the Paralympics, but for marathoning. So I was like, yeah, 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 sure, sure. And so I told my mom and I was like, okay. I was like, Adam convinced me to do the marathon. I was like, can you fly down and just like support me in Chicago? <laughs> she was like, sure. I was like so nervous. I was talking to my teammate Amanda, like she's won the Chicago marathons like several times at that point. And I was like, I told her, I was like, I'm just going to like hang in. <laughs> like, I don't know where I'm going to be, but I was like, I just hope to make it like, you know, halfway. And then like, I don't know where I'll be. Yeah. Um, so it was like really hard to like train for your first marathon. Cause then your body shifts again. You go from, you know, I was pretty like buff and like much more of a sprinter built instead mm -hmm. of, you know, a more of a marathon built. So, um, it was really, really hard. Um, and uh, yeah, and when the race happened, I was really, really excited that um, as we kept going, I was hanging on for each mile, <laughs> each mile. And then what about that hill at the end? What about the hill at the end? So at the end, by mile, uh. like, so by mile 20, I was like, oh my God, Amanda, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. And she, yeah. A little bit of a climb at the end. Yeah. Wow. So the climb at the end, so I was like, Amanda, like I can help you set up because like, I don't know what I'm doing in this marathon. Like, how can I help you? <laughs> like, I was just like, I had no idea. And she was like, well, she's like, the, the importance is like that up and that down. I was like, okay, got it. And then, so like by mile 23, I was like so Oof. nervous. And by mile 25, like my gut was just like rolling in because yeah, I was only, right? it was five of us. And so we were all like in a clump. And then I remembered like that climb in the end. So I was like, okay, then my sprinting mode came in. So I tried to set up the best situation for my like teammate. And then I was just like, we just, I, I looked at her and I was like, okay, and she's like, just sprint. <laughs> so then I just went up and I just sprinted down. Um, my mom actually missed my marathon finish because she thought I would be finishing in this second group. So she was like reaching down like for her camera and like the person lady that she made friends with at the finish line was like, I think that was just like your daughter that you were like talking about, like just like race on by winning that marathon so yeah, it was a really really good experience um chicago is a great one to start off with because it's relatively flat <laughs> except for the climate Part the finish, yeah. yeah um so it's a very strategic race and then each year i just kind of added on a marathon um to my best to my best of my ability um so then... i remember i remember that race as well because i ran i actually ran that as well let's say i was i started right behind you uh okay. i did two i did 2009 2010 uh oh, awesome. so I, okay. I remember i think was it was it a cold year 2009 i think maybe one of them was quite cold yeah probably it was cold it was wasn't it yeah and so ellen that when i tell you after 24 25 miles and then you've got this climb to do it's not all it, you want to see is a big hill to go up literally <laughs> you go around this this right turn and literally it's a climb and is it's it? like uh, oh yeah. my god it's only like about five six hundred meters yeah but that's still yeah. Oh. It's crazy, and especially because, like, you know, if you're if you change your pace and you try to go yeah. faster, you just feel like you're crawling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does, and it's 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 so it's like you're 
you'll get into the end and you just go, oh, I've only got a mile left and I've got a mile's worth of energy left. And then you see this, this climb and you go, oh, my goodness. And and if you're running, it's lactic in your legs. If you're yes. if you're running in a chair, it's lactic in the arms and shoulders, right? Yes, wow. exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So how many how many marathons have you actually done? Do you know how many you've actually completed? Oh gosh, around how many? Do you a, think? Lot. Um, a lot. Yeah. Are you just talking about like the majors only? Yeah, so the majors. Yeah, how many? Of you? um i would say like more than 50 awesome. wow yeah rock star yeah. right unbelievable <laughs> unbelievable so you've you've obviously done like nice 50 marathons just in the majors and then obviously in com combined how many combined do you do you think you've done you must have done like 70 80 marathons maybe probably i've like literally it's terrible i've lost count like it's so <laughs> <laughs> because you do like four to six a year then sometimes like um you guys you know, are crazy a marathon opens and you're like we love to like have a wheelchair division so then you yeah, go there yeah. Tatiana, yeah you come along and do it because you can do it and it's easy <laughs> right it's easy a marathon's easy but you had all that success on the road but then obviously you didn't really at that point uh, you're you're kind of obviously you being you and i know you'd want to go to the Paralympics and win a gold but at that point you'd not obviously won a gold until until the best games of ever obviously 2012 <laughs> London I'm not sure why yeah. that's the best games ever but um the, what was it was it great momentum that you took into that games or was it other people around you that gave you that confidence going into the games what was what was what how what are you feeling to then take take it into the games and you go actually I could smash it here and this mm -hmm. could set me up for everything that I want to do in my life not just athletically but everything else yeah I think that they um I think what was really exciting was that I was doing really well in the marathons at that point I'm racing really well on the track um but then the hype around you know the Paralympics got me so excited very motivated um, to do well, like to be the best, like, you know, athlete that I could be. Um, so it was like really, really hungry for those games and like to take home eventually a, a gold. And that's what I wanted. Like I was so, I fell short so many times. So I just wanted that gold medal. Um, and it was just also a different like paradigm shift for the Paralympics as well. Um, the attitude has shifted, you know, um, with the whole campaigning around London. Um, I was introduced such a, with a great sponsorship, BP, where they really paralleled everything like between the Olympics and Paralympians. So like my experience going into London was just like unbelievable. And it just made me hungry for the sport, like to be an advocate, like to do well. Um, it just, yeah, it like really inspired me to, um, like to take it home in in london in yes you did <laughs> <laughs> you, you also competed alongside your sister is that is that right as well in london yes i did yes um, what what was that like to to have a sibling next to you racing at a paralympic games um it was fun like she is so like funny you know she she could see me getting like stressed so then she would always tell a joke, you know, um, she, you know, to help me like relax. So it was like really nice having her there. Yeah. Um, and you know, with training, um, together, you know, you, you could always tell, like, I could always tell her how I was feeling and she would be so understanding. Whereas like, if you told your parents or like, you know, it's such a different statement yeah. or like, you know, with a race and all that, you know, like wins or loses, you know, mm -hmm. you could tell her and she had a very different understanding um, compared to like everybody else. Like she got it. She understood. Yeah. She went through the whole training and all that. So <laughs> it was, it was really awesome. Uh, who, who's the, who is the most competitive? I feel like you saying that you're the, the most competitive. I think, well, I mean, when we're both on the track, we're, both very competitive um yeah. just because we want to like just do well not for ourselves but for our country yeah um but like off the track we just really like to hang out and that's nice, yeah. like do a lot of fun stuff yeah yeah yeah
do you push each other as well would you say do you push each other in training and do you have training sessions together as well or yeah we definitely push each other like she has such good starts um so she was really helping me with my starts you know she was like tatiana your starts are so bad you know let me help you with that you know <laughs> so we would always do our starts together um so that was really nice having her you know next to me doing our starts and at, at london obviously as as a british athlete it was it, it was a amazing experience to be in that stadium with 80,000 people what was it like as a, an international athlete and I felt that every athlete that was in that stadium or any stadium in 2012 was supported because the public wanted to see high level uh, sport mm -hmm. and I think that was probably the first time that a lot of that public had, had seen Paralympic sport at all and all they saw was elite performers they didn't actually see disability what was it like for an international athlete having that and also did you did you understand the responsibility that you had as international international athletes at that point it was awesome um like it made me like you know very um very excited to compete um of course i was you know very nervous but like really really excited um just because you felt that energy and you felt that vibe and you knew that they understood like the athletes that they wanted to to see so like they knew like specific names right so like they knew your name they knew like um david rear's name they knew, they even knew my name so like um you know one time like i heard like a slight like chant of like my name before my event so like it that was cool because you could you could tell they they did their research um yeah. and they wanted to follow these people um, and I just, I love the commentary. Um, I loved all the, the hiring process for these Paralympics, um, you know, where they actually hire people with disabilities. The comedy shows around it was awesome. Last um, leg, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was like, it was really cool to see. So it was like, well, if London is doing this, you know, why can't we do this back in the US? Like, why can't we take that like mentality home? <clears throat> Um, so it was a great example of that, you know, like, well, like London did it. So like, let's try to bring that mentality, you know, into the marathoning or, you know, into the next games or just into sponsorships, you know, like with BP being that example, I use that example everywhere now. So it's that mentality. Yeah, it was, it, I mean, it's never forgotten. Um, and I just hope that it's still rolling there you know i hope that the mentality is still keeping up um so yeah did, did you feel like a change going back home back to america after london 2012 did you feel there was a change you know the visibility of london 2012 the way they paralleled the paralympics and the olympics y yes i did yeah there was a huge shift um you know with um more like celebrations, more media, yeah. more mainstream media, um, and the sh shift in sponsorships, yeah. um, and even the shift in uh, marathoning too, um, because you know we were in the media um, yeah. shift with NBC. So, you know, <laughs> I've known you know the people at NBC for such a long time, and um, you know, I've always told them you know there's so many amazing stories in the Paralympics yeah. like you have to give more hours like people want to see you just have yeah. to you know give it so um but it's you know so I think it was yeah it was much more celebrated and seeing is believing right isn't it seeing mm -hmm. you need to be able to see people that are, are, are in the same struggle that, that you're going through or even or even a lot of stories that we get uh, around just the visibility of people kind of being successful in their own environment. It's really important. It's not about disabled people inspiring disabled people. It's about being inspired by great people mm -hmm. challenging themselves, overcoming barriers and ad adversity. Yes, correct. And I feel like Paralympians are so relatable to society. Um, and I knew that more and more, um, in marathoning actually on the weekends because in marathoning you get you hear all different types of stories right you're all in the hotel together there's fans everywhere like there's everyone staying you know at this hotel or that hotel but like they're all running the marathon so like you just hear different stories you know all weekend and so 
That's exactly. So I think, you know, having that shift, having, you know, when NBC increased, you know, the hours, uh, um, people really began to be like, oh, wow, like, I, I find them more relatable to me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, so I want to go follow that person, you know, I want to watch the next event. And so they get really, I think, more excited to watch the sport um, and, and hear, and hear these stories for sure. Did, did you feel that shift as well going into to Rio? Um, yeah. Change? So, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. I know I felt that change going into Rio, you know, um, because we, in the U.S., we, we kind of kept that momentum going. So we had more hours with NBC. Mm. We had increase in, in sponsorships and visibility and media. Um, you know, um, unfortunately, poor Rio was in a tough state. Um, yeah. But I think the people were so excited. Um, it was awesome to do, you know, fill the seats campaign yeah. um, and being part of that with my sister um, and starting that. So it was um, that was important because, you know, school children are the way to increase mm -hmm. education and um, they, you know, they would want to see it. And so, yeah. you know, we wanted to give them the opportunity to. Um, and it was a great games. Um Lots of celebration. You won't really love to celebrate, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was um, it was a definitely a different you know different time sadly for them. But you know we did it. The games happened. It was one of my best games in my career. So um, it's a place that I always definitely remember. I was literally going to say you smashed it out of the park. You didn't just yeah. You <laughs> <laughs> just yelling yourself short. You you smashed it. But I, <laughs> did good. did you? Did you think that you should have, or did you want to win? Obviously you wanted to win all six. What was your feeling around the six events? And obviously you got four golds, which is phenomenal. Um, but did you expect in yourself to win six? Well, I was in the hundred meters, the yeah. hundred meters and I struggled. <laughs> so in uh, London, I took home a bronze. So I was just happy to be taking home that silver. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I am doing like, it's amazing because I, my discipline was so long that like I, if in the hundred meters, I'm competing against only women that like do sprinting, specifically right. only sprinting. Yeah, yeah. So to grab that silver was amazing. And same mm -hmm. with the marathon, I, could, I yeah. completely could compete against a separate group of women that just do the marathon, yeah. that like do the 5,000 and do the marathon only. Yeah. So to like win a silver in that, I was like, I'm happy you like and uh because i know what it was like not to come home with a medal so um and then the rest of the track events were amazing having that mix sweep um in the 15 and in the 5000 was like phenomenal for us i mean that picture was like it's everywhere it's kind of like in all the um offices at usopc it's like in the NDC like saved pictures it's just everywhere but it was it was the first time in history that like Team USA did a sweep ever in the Olympics and Paralympics. So That's like crazy. to do that on the Paralympic side, we were like so excited. Um, yeah. It was a phenomenal race. We talk a lot about um, consistency and like that mindset. And we actually had um, a conversation with uh, Greg Rutherford around the reason why uh, consistency is really important. And obviously you in one year, in between London and uh, Rio, you won all the all the majors, so Grand Slammed it. And um, why, why, and what uh, contributes to your consistency, especially in the marathon distance, which is so tough because you've got different environments. Obviously, the energy that you have to expend. What What do you think? If you were if you were looking back at all your performances in that period, what what mind what mindset? What mindset were you in and also what tools were you using to be consistent all the time yeah i think definitely well definitely one the training and then two just having fun and i also had like a side purpose so again my mentality was like all right i just want to be the best in my sport so i could like speak about this sport and then really get to the people about what wheelchair racing really is so we got more equality in our sport. Okay. <laughs> and that was like my mission. I mean, it still is my mission. Um, so I just wanted to 
be that psycho, I guess, and uh, <laughs> just continue in the mainstream of the events. Um, and I liked, I liked, like, I mean, I love, like, you know, speaking about it and doing the media behind it, and um, and I love racing. So it's it's, a, it's addictive, right? Winning and racing. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I just getting out there and racing, like, it's such a privilege, right? So it just makes mm. me happy that I can get out there and do it. Um, because, and I noticed that more and more after I got my injury um, in 2017, uh, well, medical injury, uh, when I was diagnosed with a blood clotting disorder. So that really, like, shifted everything for me in my career. But, um but so now racing is even more of a privilege. So it's just that that joy and that happiness and that fun. I think that's just what always keeps my my spirit going. So you achieved phenomenal medals at Paralympic Games, Summer Games, and then you, you did your eyes light up when Sochi hosted the Winter Olympics, a uh, Paralympics. Did you just go, this is where I want to be. I need to be there. I need to compete. Yeah. So when Sochi was, uh, when Sochi won the bid, um, you know, I was ecstatic. You know, I ran into my, my mom's office and she's my manager, aka my momager. And so I was like, mom, like, do you know where the, like, do you know where the next games are going to be? And she was like, yes, it's going to be in Russia. It's going to be in winter. Like, She's like, why do you care? And I was like, <laughs> well, I was like, I like, I want to, you know, be there. And she was like, okay, like, do you want me to call NBC? Do you want to commentate? Like, what are you thinking? And I was like, no, like, how do you be an athlete? Like, <laughs> what are you thinking? And um, so she was like, oh God. And she was like, okay, what sport? And I was like, oh, I was like, um cross country skiing i was like i planned it out in my head we're gonna be fine <laughs> um i was like it's an endurance sport like i have endurance from the marathon like um you have to have strength and i have strength and i was like technique is like the you know would be the hardest thing they need to learn well it was so hard to learn like um i only had like a year year and a half to like get my act together um and so i like moved out to colorado i like trained in altitude um uh, was like in the best shape of my life and um but i was so bad at the technique that like i was so bad at cross-country skiing so <laughs> you have to like at every like world championship or like world cup you had to like turn the page to see my result like physically oh, wow. turn it over like i was on the second page and so I thought to myself, like, I'm never going to make it to the games. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have to turn the page to see my results, like, I was like 20th or something. And so it was like, this is not, not good. This is not going well. And it was a really, it turned out to be a really uh, hard process because, you know, you're coming in from such a high, being so successful to like, you know, not successful, um, you know, into a completely new environment. I mean, I've had athletes and coaches say why are you just train why why can't you just get ready for Rio like why why are you trying to do like a winter sport and so you know a lot of like negativity you know um because I wasn't good and um but I just I knew my bigger picture and I knew my bigger purpose and I was like if I just stay on this path like I'm gonna be you know just fine even though it was so hard um and then I had one final like um, World Cup where it was my chance to like, you know, make, but you have to, you have to have points. Right. And so I needed like a certain amount of points and I was falling short. So um, the cross country final sprint, I made it to the finals. And so I, I think I like finished fourth. So that boosted my points way up. And so I made it into the, cross country ski team in like the um not biathlon i'm terrible at biathlon but just <laughs> for like the middle distance long distance and the sprinting i only have three events um, oh, only so, only three only that's three. a lot that's a lot still. <laughs> only three and i did it like i did pretty well like i um 
I think I was like fifth or something in like the long distance and like fourth in the middle distance. And then I won that silver in the cross country sprint. But you know, the magical thing was that like, I, it was always a dream. I had to have my birth family and my adoptive family at one competition. So, um, it was just amazing experience to have them there. I was like the cherry on, you know, the, the medal was just cherry on top. The whole yeah. experience was just so fulfilling. Um, that must be, that must have been like for you, um, all of the stars aligning. And then that moment of, of one overcoming so many obstacles just to get there and then on the podium and then to have your birth mom <laughs> there with your adoptive parents as well. Uh, that must have been amazing. That must have yeah, overwhelming, right? Yeah, I mean, it felt like such a felt like such a dream, you know, the mm. whole time. It just felt kind of, kind of like a dream, you know, it just didn't feel so real. Um, and so, but yeah, it was just an amazing experience. It was it was a very tough experience, but like um, just to get there, I think. Um, mm. But then I gained respect once I got my silver medal. People were floored. I mean, like mouth <laughs> dropped when I won that silver medal. And, um, I just, you know, I just played the race right and I was just very smart, but um, people were just floored. And so, um, but yeah, it was, it was an awesome experience. So winter sports just has such a different meaning to me, you know, um, very separate from, I think just track in general but um so it was a very good experience yeah so you've spoken about <clears throat> like working as hard as you can because you want to make change and like empower people and you've got your own law basically the tatiana law or the sports and e fitness equity law can you talk to us a little bit about that law and, and how it came about you actually <laughs> Uh, managing to to get that law after Athens yeah I was entering into into high schools I just finished up eighth yeah. grade so yeah I was going to high school and all I wanted to do was to try out for a high school sport and I I didn't know you know what was going to happen um I you know I didn't want to go to be a professional you know I, school is very important to me and so high school track is a non-tryout sport you just you show up you yeah you have to be on an honor roll. Um, you have to go to every practice. So I was following all those rules, all those guidelines. And um, then we were getting, you know, ready for our first track meet. And this is where it started to get so, so weird was that, you know, um, when it was my turn to, to get the uniform, you know, they, I didn't receive a uniform. You know, they said that I oh, wouldn't wow. be competing in that track meet. So I was very confused on why. And so um, then my mom had to call the school and she was like, what's going on? Like, why is my daughter not receiving uniform? And she was like, well, like we let her practice, you know, but like in reality, like she has sports for her own kind, like, you know, we're not gonna let her compete at these track meets. Um, you know, so it was, it all of a sudden became segregation <laughs> very quickly and like <laughs> in that phone call. So, you know, I just thought to myself, like, this is, like, I was just shocked, like, um, and my mom just had to fight on the phone just to give me a uniform, just to have me go to that track meet um, in, in county, in Howard County only. We're not talking about, like, out of Howard County. We're just talking about in Howard County. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, you know, so when I went to that track meet, they stopped the entire meet and then had me go around. And then they continued <sighs> to track me. So I just felt wow. like, okay, oh, wow. all right. <laughs> and so it just kind of felt like, um, you know, like it was a good for me, you know, um, like good to see you out. Like it just, didn't, I didn't feel like a lead athlete. It did not feel part of my high mm. school whatsoever or mm. part of the, you know, track me at all. So I thought to myself, like, Oh, what can we do? You know, so I went to my mom and I discussed and I was like, we have to do something. Like we need to change this whole process and what segregation is happening here. Discrimination is happening. Like we have to do something. So she said, the only thing we could do is sue. And so we sued for no money, no damages. Um, but right. But for the opportunity for high school students to participate in high school sports. So it was a really, really hard thing to go through as a high schooler. Um, especially being so young, you want to make friends and you 
the last thing you want to do is like have this lawsuit. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I thought my sister, Hannah, um, so she's, you know, an amputee and she liked, you know, wheelchair racing. So I thought, you know, if that's what she wants to do in high school to make friends is to become part of a sports program. Mm -hmm. Like we have to do something. We have to like change her. We have to, we have to change this so she can have a quote unquote normal high school, even though it's not normal for anybody, but, um, but just for her to fit in and be part of something. So that's what I did. I thought, okay, well, I was like, I want to use my voice. Like I have a silver and bronze medal from the Paralympics. Like I need to use it for the good. Mm -hmm. And it was the hardest thing that I've had to go through for, you know, uh, starting in 2000. Yeah. In 2006, it was crazy, but it was the craziest thing is how fast the law passed because it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so like we won within Tower County, uh, within that, um, like year. And then, uh then we won within state by the time i graduated high school so it happened so quickly um and then it became federal law when i was in college with the obama administration so um it just it was crazy how quickly it happened but you know but it was like a stepping stone right so like when you think about like the ada or accessibility it's like a trampoline where it prevents from people from going lower but it allows people to jump higher so um, and laws are forever written and it can't be changed. So I was really happy that that law was something for the good, for the common yeah. good of everybody. And um, you must, you must think about, you must think about to yourself that obviously you've done that, you and your, the passion that you, your, your, your parents have, have shown. And, um, you're obviously passionate about inclusion and the, the legacy that you leave. Is that something that you want to continue to be uh, an activist in? Uh, making sure everybody has the same platform and rights whether you've got a disability or not oh definitely yes definitely um you know i i think fun fun projects are coming in the future for that but yeah i see myself definitely being um an advocate for that and it's it's so important to be because um you know it's like i said i never thought of myself as anyone who is different and I've been an advocate, you know, in the marathons and making sure that press conferences are at the same time as everybody else's press conferences. Um, you know, like some press conferences, um, used to be so separate. Um, and, but I think it's so important that they're all integrated at the same time because then people can hear each other's stories you know, all the media is there and we need the media. Um, so, you know, but we're still, you know, trying to push for more equality. Um, but it's grown so much in the last, like, since I started marathoning in 2009. Now, the, the documentary Rise in Phoenix, um, you know, for me watching it, I felt so empowered, inspired. It must be so life changing for, for people with, disabilities like how, how did you find being a part of that that documentary and and that power and that visibility as well yeah it's it's powerful for people with disabilities and without disabilities oh, 100%. So, um you know i was talking to to greg in um at the paralympics in uh wow in, in uh four years ago and i it was the first uh, we met then um after my one of my gold medals and, you know, I was just talking about the history of the Paralympics, kind of like what I've gone through, of course, expressing my opinions and um, what, you know, we could do more for as for like for what we could do more like in the Paralympic community. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if we do more in the Paralympic community and we can create equality globally. Um, so I just sharing my stories about my high school lawsuit just growing yeah. up and all of that um and so we got to talking and i was like you know rising phoenix like sorry it was like we should you know he said that this should be a film and i was like yes like it should it should have been a film a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> i was like because it's a story that's like it's never been told before and i was like <laughs> it needs to be a film soon before someone else like does it and mm -hmm. we want it to be in the right hands and we want it to be very genuine and very authentic but in a very creative way 
Um, cause we, I was like, I want to make sure that disability is portrayed a certain way <laughs> and yeah. that like we are in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and so it was like this fantasy and this magical thinking and this like dream. And I was like, you know, we're just in this fantasy Island. And then like two years later, I got a call from him and he was like, we're going to do the film. And I was like, Oh my God, like, that's awesome. I was like, what can I do to help? Like, on this side of the world like what do you want me to do like, you know to use my platform and to speak about it um and so when he asked me to be part of it i was just like i was floored i was so excited um and it was really amazing to like talk to the the the, the whole team and just talk about you know my experience and how i see disability how i want like the world to see disability how the rest of the world you know may portray disability the inequalities that have you know, have happened in the U.S., the equalities that might have still are, you know, in the U.S. or even globally, you know, how we need to shift that paradigm, how we talk, all the, the language that we use, the interview questions that you ask, like, I was just, like, just trying to give, like, points, you know, the visual effects that you give, like, the music, like, everything matters in this film, and you get, like, one shot and one chance, and it's, it's so important to get it right and for it to mm. look really beautiful mm. and stunning. Um, it definitely does, right? <laughs> it it definitely does. It definitely it, does it, look. It's yeah, so amazing. beautiful. And yeah. um, But then I was talking to them and I said, you know, if we're going to ha have this beautiful story about the history of the Paralympics, how these athletes tell their stories, like we also have to hire people with disabilities to work on this film. Right, like, yeah. Let's make sure we get that right. <laughs> so um, I was like, that's so important because we need to hire people who are special in their own crafts, like in the film industry. So if we're talking about equality and like athletes are talking about equality, I was like, we have to keep our word. Like, I want to make sure that we keep our word. Uh, and it's, I mean, such a great team. Everybody kept their word and they learned a lot. You know, they learned about a lot about L, the researcher, and um, the directors learned a lot about her and how hard it's how hard it was for them to find an accessible building in the UK for her to do her job. So they learned something new, um, and they learned about you know our equipment and what we need you know for accessibility on the film site and um, for recovery and like how long we can be in the chairs and how long we can't be in the, you know, so they, they went through a whole like learning experience and I think it was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and they were such a great team. And, uh, but what I was really, um, and it's, yeah, and it's just, it was portrayed so beautifully and so elegantly. Um, so it made me really happy um, that you, for me, when I watched it, you know, I saw the athlete first, you know, and, and hearing these beautiful stories. Um, so you kind of got lost, you know, in the whole inspiration thing, which I wanted, you know, I wanted to, I wanted people to see, you know, the athletes and the stories first before their disability. So I think we did that right. Um, and um, yeah, it was just such a fun and um, an amazing process and a dream to me that like i mean they could have chosen anybody <laughs> uh be working on this film um but i just i mean i was honored um and i just i'm just i was happy to be voice <laughs> on it um but it was just i think it's and it was a great time that we actually had this film come out this year because people got to be educated about the paralympics um we are in a global pandemic so people are thirsty for sports. They're thirsty for good stories. So like this was the best time to to release yeah. this film instead of waiting until a little later in the year or waiting mm -hmm. until next year. Um, so I'm, I'm happy. I was very happy on, on that choice of that. Um, and I think it changed perception. A lot of people didn't know the Paralympics were parallel to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of growth, um, a lot of positivity around this film. And I think it was amazing that um, Netflix picked it up. I think it was the right group too. Uh, they've been they believed in the film as much as we did. So um, that made me really happy that you know um, that they had the same belief system um, and that it was accessible all over the world and accessible in different ways. Um, you know, closed captioning and in dubs and different languages. So. 
yeah, the, the, they they did an awesome job. The team, it's def- did an awesome, yeah, it's awesome definitely a, be- a, be- a beautiful piece of cinematic movie. That uh, if if anybody's not seen it, need to obviously go to Netflix and kind of um, go and watch that and be inspired. But no, thanks Tatiana for for your time. You're a star, and myself and Alan have been. We've learned a lot from you and we could talk for hours about your story. You've got so many interesting stories that, that I know you could you could tell us. But what we do at the end of our podcast, we do 10 quick fire questions. It's not, okay. it's not going to take long. So just 10 <laughs> quick, quick. So it's the first thing that comes out of your, your head, really. And they're just random things. The, the random questions that I came up with about six <laughs> months ago. So it could be anything. It could be anything. So, okay, okay. so the first one is... Do you want me to take the first one now? Yeah. yeah, you go for it. Okay, first one is track or ball? Track. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're winning. I think we're winning I'm on track. Uh, okay, <laughs> the next one is your greatest accomplish- accomplishment in life so far? Gold medals and rising phoenix. And Tatiana, I'm not sure if you do, but do you believe in ghosts? In spirits. Not the ones you drink or... <laughs> No, I believe that little spirits are probably out there. <laughs> okay, what's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Going for Sochi Winter Games. Oh, oh yeah. Can you sing? No. <laughs> I sound like a dying cat. <laughs> if if you were if you went to a karaoke bar, if you had to sing, what song would you sing? Uh, Run the World by Beyonce. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when are you happiest? When I have my coffee in the morning. <laughs> that's a great one. That. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> the silliest thing you've ever been upset oh. about? The silliest thing I've ever been upset about? Probably, like, the way I did my hair. Probably, like, something stupid <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that one hundred percent. Yeah, no, I'd never do mine anyway. I was going to say, Rick's probably just have that. Have I've that not problem. got a lot of hair. Left. <laughs> uh, where do you see yourself in ten years? Um. Well, I hope to be at the twenty twenty eight games in uh, in LA and uh, marathoning, and hopefully, you know, doing more following athletes and stories and promoting advocacy and sports. Tatiana, how would your your close friends describe you? Um, probably obsessive in training. <laughs> 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 um, so I would say athletic, um, um, passionate and driven. The good ones okay the last one what is your greatest fear um bugs <laughs> straight on it, bugs. Straight on it. Well, well thanks thanks from uh for myself and alan for such great uh interaction and uh we we've we've uh, really enjoyed it i hope you've enjoyed being on with us and uh Les, thanks for your time i know how precious yeah, it is Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So there we go. Tatiana McFadden, an advocate, somebody that's passionate about sport. What comes out from her podcast for me is how much she wants to give back to her sport and how much she wants to have an impact on sport for for those youngsters coming through, but also in the right ways. I've seen a lot of athletes that have been takers, but Tatiana's definitely somebody that wants to give to sport and that's not just performance and Paralympic level all the way down to the development side changing the laws in her her country and I think she could have a massive impact not just on uh, the sport in in America but also all over the world. I was going to exactly say that I was going to talk about like global equality and yeah how much she is such a an amazing advocate not just for for Paralympians or or disability people but but everyone i was in role model for to, women oh incredible i think well i said it at the start of the of the podcast you know she looks in, incredible like so athletic and she's such a lovely person as well which really comes across um in the interview as well so it was amazing to speak to her and i really like the fact that 
um, she talked about when the Paralympics wasn't celebrated and she wanted to be able to have a voice. Um, so she's like, right, I've got to become the best. Then people will listen to me. And I found that really engaging and really lovely as well, that she is the best and people the best person need she could to be. listen to her. Exactly. And, and, and for me, when you look at uh, a woman and a sportswoman and a, and a sportsman, you want to have the qualities that she's gain she's got that toolkit that she's developed through her life experiences and she's had some great role models from her family but also she's had to overcome some some barriers and obstacles that i can only like obviously where she grew up uh, having to move to a, a country where she couldn't speak the language and then sport was that platform like we know to be able to engage and break down some of those social barriers which is really nice to hear that that's happening over in America as well as ob obviously here as well it, and it's it's definitely happened with women's football and also in, in Paralympic sport and there's definitely some synergies with, with some of the obstacles and challenges that I've had to overcome um, at an early age regarding regarding that inequality and those lack of opportunities but sport has definitely bridged those. Yeah and I hope that those watching and you know thank you everyone that is watching that they do take so much away from this interview with Tatiana because she is such an inspiring person and, and hopefully it can encourage people to to take part in sport because sport can do amazing things for for so many people so uh yeah thank you so much for everyone that's been watching and listening track and ball podcast I've been Ellen White and I've been Richard Whitehead cross comes in White with the header and here comes Whitehead. It's gold for Great Britain. 